title of tonight's talk is We Expect Political Democracy, Why Not Economic Democracy Too? When we agreed this title, doesn't we know that today your Chancellor would be making his autumn statement? So very fortuitous timing. And uh, we really want to discuss two elements. Um, first is the issue about the deficit, and the second, more broadly, about democratizing the economy. Um, to start with, I'd say that the austerity package that we're being sold, and we're now being told it's going to last until 2018, which may indeed be quite optimistic, uh, we're told that that is inevitable, that spending cuts are the necessary price we must pay to plug the government deficit. Um, my view is that this is one of the biggest cons ever perpetrated on the British people. Um, we are witnessing today a tax upon the welfare state and public services that even Margaret Thatcher did not contemplate. David Cameron has out Thatchered Thatcher. And that's saying quite a big deal. Uh, it is extraordinary the way in which the government has succeeded in using the financial crisis as a means or justification to secure a massive redistribution of wealth and a swinging attack upon the welfare state and public services. It's using the crisis as an excuse. A useful excuse to mask what has always historically been conservative intention, which is to reduce the state, reduce public spending, privatize, and roll back the historic gains of working people in this country. I feel real pain when I look at what is happening to the welfare state. I feel real pain for the older generations who fought so hard to ensure social provision for people in need. I feel so much pain for the many millions of British people who fought a war against fascism and then demanded and won a post-war settlement that was intended to make our society more compassionate and equal. And now, two generations later, those gains are being slowly, gradually, but surely withered away. You know, the privatization of the National Health Service is happening before our eyes. The privatization of the welfare state is happening before our eyes. These great historic gains of the British people are being undermined eroded and ultimately will be severely diminished. There may be fragments that survive, but they will only be fragments. And tragically, although there is disappointment, disagreement, and even downright opposition to these changes, we as a nation have failed to challenge and resist these dramatic changes. We've allowed it to happen. Now, it's not inevitable, because we saw just two decades ago when Margaret Thatcher's government attempted to introduce the poll tax, how millions of people in this country rebelled. Initially, of course, the opposition to the poll tax was led by the opposition, the Labour opposition in Parliament. And they made many fine speeches against why the poll tax was unjust and wrong. At the end of the day, they were outvoted. But the British people decided they would not allow this injustice to be perpetrated. The idea that rich and poor should pay the same, that a millionaire should pay as much poll tax as you know, a family of working people on average income, people saw that was fundamentally wrong. And they rebelled. 
hundreds of thousands marched in the streets. Millions more delayed their payments or refused to pay the poll tax. Eventually, the system became unworkable. And even Margaret Thatcher, although she said this policy was not negotiable, was forced to climb down and abandon the poll tax. This happened just two decades ago. It shows the potential and power of ordinary people to challenge injustice and to change government policy. What I want to know is, where is the comparable rebellion today against an even more severe attack upon the rights and justice of ordinary people? So we're told that there is no alternative to austerity, that public spending cuts are inevitable and a necessary solution. Well, that is one big lie. And I'm going to just briefly suggest to you ways in which we could manage the deficit, indeed solve the deficit, without any need for any public spending cuts. The first thing we could do would be to cancel the Trident nuclear missile program, which would save a staggering 100 billion pounds over 30 to 40 years. Aside from the fact that this is just a prestige, vanity military project, which no one really seriously thinks can address real security issues in the world today, the massive expenditure on the Trident nuclear program is detracting from spending that could be sustained in the provision of the welfare state and public services. So Council Trident would save around about a hundred billion pounds. For any of you who are familiar with the campaigns of UK and Cut and others, you will know that if the government closed tax avoidance loopholes, which are being exploited by companies like Starbucks, Starbucks Vodafone, Boots, and so on, that this could bring in an extra 20 billion pounds a year. 20 billion pounds a year. Some people say more, but I'll be on the conservative side. I'll say 20 billion pounds a year. Closing the tax avoidance loopholes. Um, if we introduced the financial transaction tax, the so-called Tobin tax, named after the economist who came up with the idea, if it was set at 0.05%, that's just 1 20th of 1% on all financial transactions. So banking transactions, share transactions, commodity transactions, bond transactions, and so on, that would raise between 50 to 100 billion pounds a year in the UK alone. 50 to 100 billion pounds a year. A staggering sum. If we further abolished pension tax relief on people earning incomes of more than £100,000 a year, that is, quite well-off people, if we abolish their pension tax relief, that would raise at least another £20 billion. £20 billion. Um, you can see that there are quite clearly alternatives. Alternatives which the government are not examining, let alone implementing. Now, of course, it's true today that there was a modest, an exceedingly modest uh, reform of pension tax relief to reduce the uh, exemptions for the very rich, but it was tiny. It was a drop in the ocean. Nothing by comparison to what is warranted. And the final suggestion I have is that there is a compelling case, given that we are in an extreme financial crisis, for a one-off 
20% wealth tax on the richest 10% of the British population. The richest 10% in Britain have a combined personal wealth of 4 million million pounds. 4 trillion pounds. That's a million pounds multiplied 4 million times. <coughs> the people from the middle to upper range of that richest 10% have fabulous wealth. They have multiple homes in this country and abroad. In many instances, they have luxury cars, private jets and yachts, vast personal art collections. These people could easily afford to pay a one-off 20% tax. How much would that raise? A one-off, once only, 20% tax on the richest 10% of the British population would raise a staggering 800 billion pounds. 800 billion! That's enough to pay off the government deficit more than six times over. Or, even better, perhaps to start paying off some of the national debt, which is crippling us with interest payments in the region of 50 billion pounds a year. Or better still, it could be used to fund the Green New Deal. Modeled on Roosevelt's New Deal, the Green New Deal is a program of government investment in green energy, energy conservation, improved public transport, and so on. It would create hundreds of thousands, perhaps even more than a million new jobs. And these would be jobs in areas of skilled, semi-skilled, and low-skilled. Jobs that people could easily be trained up to do. You know, we could cut out energy needs by 20 to 30% by a sustained program of energy insulation in homes, offices, and factories. No need for any new nuclear power stations, or gas-fired power stations, or coal-fired power stations. A 20 to 30% cut in energy needs. And we put putting people back to work. And of course, the economics is quite simple. You know, John Maynard Keynes worked this out, getting on for a century ago. And it got, or helped get, many countries out of recession <coughs> in the 1930s. You know, if you create jobs, you take people off the dole, they're no longer a drain on the public finances because we don't have to pay them benefits. Instead, they're in work, and they're paying the Exchequer tax and national insurance. They've also got money in their pockets, so they go out and buy things. And that stimulates the economy. It leads to new businesses starting up to meet the increased need and demand. You know, I am not the world's greatest economist, or anything near it. But you don't have to be to understand the simplicity that austerity leads to the downturn of the economy. That when you contract the economy, when you make millions of people unemployed or doing only part-time work, you deprive them of income, they've got less money to spend, and therefore businesses go to the wall. Because demand is down. So this one-off 20% tax idea to me, makes economic, and very importantly, moral sense. Because economics is not a moral free zone. I want to live in a society where the economy is run in an ethical way. Where it doesn't just benefit the very rich, the powerful, the privileged, but where it gives everybody 
opportunities and life chances. And that is good for social cohesion, it is good for society, it is good for communities, it's good for individuals. George Osborne is fond of the phrase, we're all in this together. Oh no, we're not. Oh no, we're not. The poorest in our society are bearing the brunt of an economic crisis that they did not create. The current economic crisis was created by bankers and big corporations, and they have a moral responsibility to help fix it. It's absolutely wrong that the poorest should be made to pay, as we're seeing in today's autumn statement, where the Chancellor has said he intends to freeze benefits for many claimants, poor and needy people. In real terms, their benefits will be frozen for the next three years. He's saying this because of the financial downturn. But these poor and needy people on benefits didn't create the downturn. In fact, they are victims of it. Many of them are out of jobs precisely because of the recklessness and irresponsibility of people at the top. Both the government, the deregulated, and of course, banks and businesses who used and exploited every loophole in the book in a greedy rush to increase their personal wealth at the expense of the rest of society. The economic crisis was not an accident. Sure, it wasn't just a UK phenomenon, it was a global phenomenon. A global phenomenon caused by greedy banks and greedy businesses who were just out for a quick buck <coughs> without any think, thought, without any thought, to the long-term consequences and the impact on the wider society. And that is, of course, the ruthlessness of the free market capitalist system. It's all about private wealth and greed, or rather, mostly about private wealth and greed, and only secondarily about the interest of the economy and society as a whole. We are talking, as I said, about people in our country who have fabulous wealth. The richest 1% of the population in this country earn more than £3,000 a week. The richest 1% earn more than £3,000 a week. And in many cases, much, much more than £3,000 a week. They have a combined personal wealth of one trillion pounds. That's a million, million pounds. Um, the entire UK gross domestic, domestic product is about 1.5 trillion. 1.5 trillion is the entire UK gross domestic product. The wealthiest 1% have almost the equivalent in personal private wealth. The richest 1,000 people in this country have a combined personal wealth of 414 billion. 414 billion. 1,000 people owning 414 billion pounds in wealth. And during this economic downturn, their wealth has increased. Increased. They'd be getting more money, more wealth, despite all the suffering that so many of us have been going through. This is a fundamentally immoral economic system. Fundamentally immoral. In terms of how we fix things, I've suggested a raft of ideas, even excluding the 800 billion pounds that could be raised by a one-off 20% wealth tax. I've suggested a series of other proposals, like cancelling Trident, closing tax avoidance loopholes, ending pension tax release on people earning more than £100,000, 
and the financial transaction tax, those proposals themselves <coughs> add up to in the region of £200 billion. Pounds. £200 billion. So, with the wealth tax proposal, you're talking about a thousand billion pounds. There is wealth in this society. It is nonsense that Britain is broke. It's ridiculous and absurd to suggest that we are on our uppers as a nation. We're not. The problem is wealth is unevenly distributed. Some people don't have enough. Others have more than they even know how to spend. And the true challenge of a moral, ethical government would be to fix that system, to make it more equitable. I'm not saying level it so we're all the same. I'm just saying reduce the disparities. End the need for these public spending cuts that are hitting people, genuine people, who are genuinely on welfare. Not by choice, but by illness or disability, or the fact that the bankers have destroyed the economy and they're out of a job. Those people need help. They deserve help. It costs £7 billion to keep 1 million people on the dole. £7 billion to keep 1 million people on the dole for one year. For the same amount of money, the government could create 400,000 new jobs. 400,000 new jobs. People back in work with the dignity and pride of having their own incomes, looking after themselves, not depending on the state, not having to be paid benefits, but contributing in tax and national insurance. Buying goods and services to help stimulate the economy. It really is quite simple if we had a government who had the will to stand up to big business. But as we all know, we haven't had such a government since 1945. <laughs> that was the last time we had a government that even made a, a motion towards standing up against big business for the rights and welfare of ordinary people. You know, a lot of these problems were initiated and caused by the last Labour government. And you know, I'm sorry, but Ed Miliband and Ed Balls, when they critique this government, I just think to myself, what did you do when you were in power? You were the ones who deregulated the city. Your, one of your acolytes, Lord Manderson, said he was relaxed about the filthy rich. I'm sorry, we don't really have an opposition in this country. We may have smaller parties like the Greens and Respect, who are trying to present a new alternative model of economics, but they're tiny. The big three parties are in it together. There's hardly any difference between them. Yes, there are differences, but not differences of substance. The differences are minor. We've got corporate politics to correspond and reflect corporate business. When you go to the ballot box, you don't really have a genuine, valid choice. You've got choices that are just variations on the same economic model. It's only the minor parties that are trying to say, we need a whole new economic blueprint, a whole new agenda to rebalance and change the economy. So that brings me to the whole issue of economic democracy. We accept that in the political system we have one person, one vote. If you're rich or poor, you've got one vote. There's no Apart from the city of London, <laughs> where some very rich people have all the votes. Um, otherwise, in the economy, you have a different model. In the economy, you have a situation where the very wealthy 
have all the votes. The economy is not run on democratic lines. We're basically living under a system of economic dictatorship, where all the votes are held by the very rich, the major shareholders, the directors, the managers. Ordinary people who work in public and private enterprises have no real say about how those enterprises operate. They are excluded from economic decision making. And if you look at the economy as a whole, you see that a very, or relatively small, number of private corporations have excessive, extreme, centralised power over the economy. Most of the big multinational corporations. So what I want to suggest is that the unfinished democratic revolution is to bring the economy more into alignment with the political system. To give us a system of economy that parallels the democracy of the political system. Having said that, of course, I'm not saying for one moment that the political system is perfect. You know, until 2010, we hadn't had an elected government in Britain that had won a majority of votes since 1945. Every single government, until 2010, and we had a coalition, every preceding government had been elected on a minority of votes. Margaret Thatcher's landslide of 1983, Tony Blair's landslide of 1997. Both parties, Conservatives and Labour, in those elections, won about 42-43% of the vote. A minority of the votes. Yet they won vast landslides in terms of numbers of seats. In 2005, I think I'm right in saying that Labour won about 36% of the popular vote, but it ended up with 55% of the seats. That's not democracy. It's a rigged system. The first-past-the-post voting system works well if you've only got two parties. But once you have a multi-party system, it doesn't work. It means that millions of people who vote for minor parties either never get any MPs elected or only a handful. Even in the last election, the Liberal Democrats who I don't support, but nevertheless, they got far fewer seats than their percentage of the popular vote would indicate. Grossly unfair. But anyway, that's another issue. All I'm just making the point is, the political system ain't perfect, but at least the principle of one person, one vote has been established. And what I want to see is some analogous system working in the economy. Now, what I want to do now is share with you a few ideas how this might happen. Um, the first thing sort of relates to my initial aspect of the talk, which is about accountability. I would like to see corporate recklessness and negligence made an explicit criminal offence. If a doctor or a solicitor or any other professional behaves in an unethical way that is reckless, negligent or irresponsible, they can be hauled before a disciplinary body and struck off and indeed ultimately potentially even prosecuted. Why doesn't such a system apply to business? Why is it that the barons of business are allowed to get away with palpably irresponsible, reckless and negligent decisions which impact on millions of other people. Why should they be able to gamble with people's money and put at risk jobs, savings, pensions? Because that's what they did. If we had a system of whereby criminal charges could be preferred against someone in business for reckless, irresponsible or negligent behaviour. If we had that system in place, we had an explicit offence, so let's say way back in 
10 years ago. I suspect that Sir Fred Goodwin, or Mr. Fred Goodwin as I prefer to call him, uh, would not have behaved in the way he did. Nor would have the other RBS directors, nor would have the directors of Northern Rock. If they, have no if they had known that they could be held personally liable, financially liable, and even face the prospect of imprisonment for reckless, irresponsible choices and decisions, I believe they would have acted much more cautiously. I don't believe they would have taken the wild gambles that they did. The wild gambles that they did with other people's money. If they'd known that they could be held responsible, that they could be struck off and forbidden from practicing business, be held financially responsible, you know, to have to cough up the money, then I suspect they would have behaved very differently. I think it's perfectly reasonable, and any moral, honest businessman would agree to such a system. Because financial recklessness and negligence is, of course, bad for business. We now, as a country, have problems about our financial credibility and integrity because of what has been done. That's bad for our economy. <coughs> it's bad for business. So even just looking at it from a business point of view, aside from the ethical and moral considerations, quite clearly something needs to change. That's just, just one idea. It's a very simple idea. It could be legislated tomorrow. I propose this to all the parties, but I'm sorry, not a single one is prepared to do it. Why not? Why are they so reluctant to want to make this law? When clearly such a law could act as a safeguard, a check and a balance to ensure greater corporate prudence. The second idea relates more directly to the idea of economic democracy. I would like to see a system introduced where any public or private enterprise with more than 50 employees should be required by law to have on its board of directors at least one third employee and consumer representatives. So in other words, they would have on their boards representatives from the staff, the workforce, and representatives from consumers appointed independently. They would have voting rights, full knowledge of the operation of the company. They would have the power to ask questions, to challenge those in authority. Now, before people say this is a wild, radical idea, it sort of exists in a watered-down form in Germany with the works councils. And the German works councils, they have employee representatives on the boards. Some people would argue that's one of the reasons why Germany, on the whole, has better industrial relations and a fairer equity between the bosses and employees. Um, I'm certain that if we did have employee and consumer directors on the boards, we'd be much more likely to get wiser, more responsible corporate decision making. Much more likely. Um, also, of course, those employee and consumer directors would be able to challenge other directors who were making decisions that were quite clearly gambling, because that's what we've seen you know, in the last uh, few years, gambling with the future of their companies uh, and with other people's money. Um, I suspect also that employee and consumer directors would bring an influence to the board uh, much more uh, addressing the issue of the social responsibility of a company. Um, so in terms of 
investment and product decisions, I suspect that employee and consumer directors would be inclined to give a greater social justice considerations, greater considerations to environmental impact, um, further greater considerations to the uh, effects on local communities of business decisions. So anything we can do about all these noises, there's a bleeping over there. It's just that. It's just that. <laughs> but there's bleeping over there. Is it, I think it was that. Was it? Okay. okay. I'll get Danny, okay. just hit the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and again, if we look at you know the decisions made by some banks and companies in recent years, if they had those employee and consumer directors on the boards, I think we would have got a different set of decisions. And if we didn't those employee and consumer directors could have blown the whistle. Now, I don't think Northern Rock and RBS and others would have made those reckless, irresponsible decisions if they'd been employee and consumer directors having oversight and holding them to account. I mentioned this is not as wildly radical as it really sounds. I mentioned the German Works Council system. But of course, way back, in 1976, in this country, the Labour government, the then Labour government of Jim Callaghan, commissioned Lord Bullock to do a report on industrial democracy. <coughs> and he came up with the proposal that all private companies with more than 50 employees should have an equal number of employee and managerial directors. There should be 50% representation by employees on the boards of all companies with an independent, mutually agreed chair. Now that's radical. I'm not going that far. I'm just saying one third. My proposal is very modest. Sadly, and very foolishly, the trade unions voted that proposal down. They said it was corporatist. They said it was like bring them in within the, the, the remit of corporate business. One of the most stupid decisions ever taken by the trade union movement in this country. And I speak as a trade unionist. It was one of the most stupid decisions they ever took. If they had had 50% representation on the boards of companies, we would have a very different economy today. A better, fairer, more just, and probably more productive economy. Because social considerations can often lead to better investment decisions. Anyway, that was a fair. I mentioned initially that this should apply to both private and public enterprises. So, for example, local councils of the NHS should have at least one third employee and consumer directors on their boards. You know, I'm sure the NHS would operate even better with that representation. I say so as someone who uses the NHS, and at my local hospital, um, they have a very poor appointment system, which wastes a lot of time for both staff and patients. I've often suggested it be modified. I've even come up with a little plan of my own from a consumer point of view. And I broke some of the stuff and said, brilliant idea. We've already suggested that, or something very similar. The problem is, we don't have any power. This NHS Trust, it's all run by managers and consultants. We, the workers who work in this enterprise, have no say. The nurses, the ancillary staff, the cleaners, whatever, have no real meaningful say. The NHS is run like a private business. And so that means that decision making and input from ordinary staff and indeed patients counts for very little. The second idea I propose is that to decentralise investment and control of capital, I'd like to see pension funds handed over to employee mutual societies so that the employees who are the owners of these pension funds actually do control them. Instead of hiring them off to big business, 
give it over to employee neutral societies. Let them appoint financial experts to run the pension fund, but run the fund under the direction of the employees whose pensions they are looking after. Now, as you probably know, pension funds account for about one third of the stock market. Nearly £1,000 billion pounds worth. That's a huge wage of investment capital. Again, I'm certain that if employees had a controlling say over how pension funds invested, yes, they would want to get a good return, but I suspect also they'd be more inclined to think about social and environmental considerations as well. And particularly if the business was localised, they'd probably consider the impact on the local community of that company's investment decisions. So it'd have a positive offshoot or effect in terms of the regional and local economy. I suspect also they'd be more inclined to want to avoid investment in the arms trade, sweatshop labour in developing countries, and other no-nos. They'd be more inclined to go for investments in renewable energy, new medical treatments, high-tech public transport, and so on. What I'd call more socially useful production. Of course, there's no guarantee, but I'm, I'm suggesting that that probably would be a stronger influence than under the current system where everything is left to the privately owned pension funds whose bid is always profit maximisation. Um, once again, um, I'm certain that if pension funds were controlled by employees through mutual societies, then you would get a decentralisation of decision making, you'd get a decentralisation of investment, you'd start to have counterbalances to the huge influence of corporate capital. And as we know, having checks and balances, having alternatives, having counterbalances is good for the economy. Because if you put all your eggs in one basket, if you have a monolithic economy with concentrated corporate power, you risk, if anything goes wrong, the whole economy being adversely affected. Another idea is the idea of wage earner profit sharing. The Swedish economist Rudolf Meidner in the 1960s and 70s came up with the idea of what he called wage earner funds. And the proposal was broadly that if a company increases its productivity, by law that company should be required to pay into an employee controlled fund a share of the increased productivity. So his idea was to make by law increases in productivity to be shared, to be shared by the people who create that increased productivity, instead of it all going to the shareholders and the managers and directors. A very simple idea, and one that's very good for the economy, because of course, if employees feel they have a meaningful stake in increasing productivity, they're more likely to work well, to feel that they've got an investment in this company, that this company respects them and values them. And so they'll work better. They'll be less likely to strike. They'll be more likely to solve problems when they experience them. They'll want to get solutions. And they will know that if they do, they will share in the gains. Of course, Rudolf Meidner had the fantastical idea that eventually, through increased productivity, which of course many workers themselves would want to find ways of achieving, they would eventually get a controlling stake in their company. Because as productivity increased over time, the share capital owned by the employees would increase and eventually it would reach more than 50% so they would have a controlling stake. In fact, they probably wouldn't even need 50%, probably need 20 or 25% would be enough 
to give the employees a controlling stake. Again, an interesting idea, and one that fits, I think, with ideas of equity and social justice. Um, the final thing I'd suggest is the idea of the right of employees, the legal right, to buy out their companies and turn them into worker cooperatives. Um, at the moment, yes, in certain circumstances, employees can do this. But the whole raft of legal obligations and difficulties, I'd like to see you know, a legal requirement or a legal right of employees to buy out their companies and turn them into employee-owned enterprises. Why? Well, again, it's about who creates the wealth. You know, the real wealth of this country is created by people who do the public services, who work in businesses that create things or provide services. It's the frontline people that are real, true wealth creators. The investors, the shareholders, yes, they, they, they move capital around, they invest, but in terms of the actual wealth, it's the people in the front line that are actually creating it and sustaining it. Um, if we look at countries like Spain, where there's a long tradition of workers' cooperatives, they are very successful. Here in Britain, we've always tried to do workers' cooperatives with companies that have been on their uppers. Um, you know, try out for Meridian motorcycle companies and so on. Um, these are companies in dire straits, and then the attempt was to turn them around by turning them into workers' cooperatives. What we need to do is establish a system whereby companies that are successful can also become workers' cooperatives, if that is the wish of the employees. And of course, with proper due compensation to the people who put in the money to create and build those companies in terms of capital investment. You know, we don't want to rob them. You know, they should get their proper, proper returns. Um, but ultimately, employees should have the right to uh, have control of the companies in which they work, if they wish. And of course, this not only is a matter of fairness and justice, again, it will also, I think, lead to greater productivity and better uh, run enterprises. If employees have a stake, a real genuine stake in the way in which companies are run, or indeed public institutions like the health service, then they do and would have a greater commitment. They work harder, they want to find ways to make their enterprises more successful. Another idea, just very briefly, is bonuses. We've heard about all the notorious bonuses for bankers and other corporate bosses. They already get huge vast salaries. How can you possibly justify these multi-million pound bonuses on top? Are they really 500 times more effective and productive than a shop floor worker or an office worker? I don't believe so. I don't believe they actually bring that much extra value to a company or a public service. I'm not saying that all wages or salaries should be leveled, no. I'm just saying reduce the huge disparity, which in Britain are some of the highest in the world. And of course, if you do that, then again, you are creating a sense of social solidarity and cohesion, a sense, yes, that we are in this together, and we're going to share the fruits together, rather than all the best bits be creamed off by the very rich and powerful. Um, in terms of bonuses, I would say that the government, faced with the current economic crisis, the government should have said to public service workers, we're going to give you bonuses if you can find ways of making your public service run just as well, but more cheaply. So we, the government should not accept any reduction in services, but it should issue a challenge to employees in the health service, in local councils, in schools, Come up with ideas about how you can save money. 
And now ultimately the taxpayer, the government, can save money. And if you do this in ways that don't diminish services or jobs, then we will reward you. We'll give you a bonus, maybe 5% or 10% of the saving that you come up with. Again, to me, it seems so obvious that it's the right thing to do and the effective thing to do. Because frontline staff, whether they be in public service or private service, over their lifetime have accumulated a huge wealth of knowledge about their particular job, about how the enterprises run and so on. My father was an engineering worker, a lathe operator in an engineering factory. Over his 40 plus years of work, he accumulated a huge amount of knowledge, not just about lathe work, but about how the business was run. And he always used to remind me, they're wasting money. They're, they're, they're going hell for leather to get profits, but they're wasting money in this way, this way, this way. And same with the public services. I applaud public service workers. I love public services. But like any institution, there is waste. I'm not saying, like some people say, that waste can solve, getting rid of the waste can solve all the problems, but it probably can save some of the problems. And going back to that appointment system of my local hospital, the staff there said, the current system wastes money. Wastes money. So fix it, you're going to save money, you're going to give patients a better deal, you're going to help the staff, and you're going to save money. So, rather than imposing top-down cuts, I would have liked the government to have issued this challenge to employees and offered them this reward. Then maybe some of the cuts, at least, would not be necessary. So those are just a, a few ideas. A very few ideas. I don't claim they're perfect. I don't claim they're a panacea. I'm not an economic expert, but to me, from a common sense point of view, they seem plausible and credible that there are surely other experts who can refine them, develop them, improve them. What I want to see is these ideas put on the table for discussion. Instead of us going around blinkedly thinking that there was no alternative to the government's austerity program, let's just open our eyes and minds to the possibility that there are other options. Other options which would get us out of this mess and also, of course, make for a more just and equitable society. The final point I'd say is that many of you may well argue, well, look, you know, if you take these measures, big business won't like it, the rich won't like it, they'll leave. Well, my response is, our country should never allow itself to be blackmailed. Never allow itself to be blackmailed by these constant <coughs> threats and intimidation by the megalomaniac rich who think they've got a right to blackmail our country and our people into doing what they want by holding it over, the, over us this threat that they will run and leave. Vince Cable, the business secretary, said that the current financial situation we face is in some respects analogous to wartime. It's a major challenge to the future of this country. Our prosperity, our sense of social justice, our future. And I think he's right. This is one of the biggest challenges this country has faced since the Second World War. And I think what it requires is a degree of patriotism. Patriotism by the rich. I don't use patriotism in a jingoistic sense. I abhor that. But if the rich truly love this country, they would be prepared to make the sacrifices to put things right. After all, they benefited disproportionately during the boom times, so surely they should make greater sacrifice during the the downtime. This is about morality and ethics. If you love this country, if you care about the people of this country, you would want to put things right. And if you had great wealth, you'd be prepared to sacrifice some of it. 
you don't often quote Spider-Man, but <laughs> with great wealth comes great responsibility. And that's true of the economy and the way in which our society is run. The problem is many people, I'm not saying all people, but many people at the top, don't show much responsibility, let alone care and compassion for their fellow citizens. I think we have to create a citizens movement, which UK Uncut and others are beginning to do, to challenge the super rich, to behave responsibly and ethically, to put them on the spot, to make them face up to their moral and ethical responsibilities, and to shame those who still want to get away with unjustified wealth and extravagance. It is about working together in a genuine way to solve a very grave economic crisis, which even at this stage could potentially tip over into a new Great Depression. I would even go as far as to say that actually it's in the interests of the very rich to do this. The very rich have a vested self-interest to fix the economy because if they don't, and if the economy goes bottom up, they will lose a huge amount of their personal wealth. Much more than the 20% wealth tax would take. If you look at the Great Depression, the vast volume of wealth that the super rich lost was way in excess, in most cases, of 20%. Well, you know, if we go into a second Great Depression, or if we end up with economic ruination brought on by climate destruction, which is quite possible in 50 or so years' time, they will lose far, far more. So making the sacrifice now is actually in the interests of the very rich. I've made my case imperfectly, but I think you get the drift. Let's think about alternatives. Let's tell our friends and families that there are alternatives. That the government's lie that there is no alternative to austerity is a big lie. A huge, enormous lie. And that all these different ideas that I've discussed with you have the potential, have the potential to help solve the problem without destroying the health service or the welfare state, or even without diminishing it, let alone destroying it. If we can individually, one-on-one, -on -one, get this message out, then we can ultimately create a people's movement to force change, to force the big three parties to change course from propping up a discredited, failed system. If we as a people can force Margaret Thatcher to ditch the poll tax, we can certainly force George Osborne and David Cameron to abandon authority. Thank you.